Hello. Welcome to the stream. Thank you all for joining me. Sorry for the slightly late start. Today's been a hot mess. Uh, some ways good, some ways not. But it is. Yes, Krellen, welcome. Uh, also, thanks for not minding that I had to start the stream. Really, I didn't update the name or the title. <laughs> Started it, restart. Stopped, restarted it. It was just, yeah. I have my like workflow, but I didn't write it in my calendar for this week, uh, which means I didn't do it right. <laughs> just been so busy, and there's so much drama in my life these days. It feels like I'm in high school again. Anyways, welcome to the stream. If you don't know who I am, my name is Ariana. I am the co-director of the Consent Academy, a Seattle-based nonprofit that aims to promote consent culture in every aspect of daily life from the bedroom to the boardroom. And today we're going to play some Stardew Valley. We're going to look at some memes. Mostly I have fun memes today, a couple of political memes. We're going to read a little bit more of the book Surviving the Future. And then we're going to play Stardew Valley and talk about uh, why the parties in Stardew Valley kind of suck and how they could be better. And how the governor sucks at partying. I think that's, I, yeah, I titled this, Why the Governor Sucks at Parties. Let's talk about autonomy through solidarity and solidarity through carnival. Okay, it's kind of a, a weird name, I know. I just kind of like put it together as I realized that I mistitled, or that I didn't update the name of the stream. <laughs> anyway, like I said, hot mess today. Hello, Reverend Mort as well, welcome. I uh, am wearing my same outfit from last time, my festival shirt jacket, because we're talking more about festivals. And it is incredibly comfy. Like, it's very light cotton, because, right, like, this is something I would wear during Tyco. And uh, you don't want to get super hot. And you want to be able to move easily and not have your, like, cloth get in the way of the big drums and... Facebook reminded me of a post I made nine, nine years ago about joining the Tyco Club and how I was going to get ripped and I was going to have the best shoulders. And it did happen. It really helped. I miss my arms. I miss, miss being a strong girl. Anyway, anyway, I don't know who made this picture. I found it on, I think, Imager. Yeah, definitely Imager, because that's what the URL says. Uh, you always want to be super hot, Reverend Mort? Yeah, I mean, there's that too. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, I don't know who made this credits to whoever did. And it's a picture of like a city and a forest. And then you've got like some deer. You've got like some intermediate grassland. And then you've got a body of water. And it says the word bloom on two spots. And then it also says, we can make this world an infinite garden. And the word organize in here. Because this is also one of those things where I really want to stress that we can make positive changes. We talk about a lot of social issues on the stream, both Tuesday and Sunday's streams. We talk a lot about, you know, uh, ways things could be better, but we also tend to talk about work that people are actually doing. Like the people who come on to my Sunday streams are people who are trying to help make the world different. And you know, even my partner who was on last Sunday does a, did a lot of union work and a lot of union organizing and activism and did a lot of like support and solidarity for people in his department who were facing like sexism from professors because you can imagine there's a lot of that in the physics department and you know and he's very supportive of the work i do at consent academy and that's organizing right it organizing does not also have to be like you're the person out there with the megaphone chanting in the street it can be support roles it can be the people who bring water bottles and food to the rally or help clean up after the rally to make sure that you know, uh, people don't use the mess 
for political purposes or whatever. It can be the people who knock on doors. Um, I really want to stress, like, I think I mentioned it on the last stream last week on uh, Netflix, Adam from Adam Rooms Everything, Adam Koval, uh, has a new show called The G Word. And one of the big things that is shown, especially towards the end of the miniseries, is two dudes who wanted to create positive change in their community and make their city more resilient, improve infrastructure, improve, you know, racial disparities and bail uh, and just all kinds of stuff. And how did they do it? They just knocked on doors and talked to their neighbors. They got people to be engaged. Similarly, I watched this HBO document documentary about it was like uh, looking at everything that's happened since the start of the pandemic and like different levels of responses and different responses in different areas. And it was not a very good documentary and it didn't really have anything like coherent to say. It was just kind of like footage kind of put together. I still recommend watching it because one of the coolest things in that documentary is not about the government stuff, not about the politics. It's depressing because you see how much of like governmental response to the pandemic has been fueled by political motivations and expediency and gain. The thing that's really cool is you had um, community leaders in a black community who knew that there was going to be vaccine hesitancy, that, you know, there was going to be a lot of distrust of medical officials because of the history of governments experimenting medically on black people and also denying care to black people and like all of that <laughs> really difficult history like people often talk about like tuskegee and the tuskegee experiments but there's so much more to the history of like using black people uh and our perceptions of how their bodies function uh to do medical experimentation on them so there's a big distrust and it's not an unreasonable distrust right like they have a lot of evidence for why they shouldn't trust the government and medical authorities and COVID is real so what did the community leaders do before the vaccine was even hi did you run uh before the vaccine was even invented and completed they went around and they started talking to the neighbors in the community finding out what they need, making sure they had things that they needed. If they were quarantining and couldn't leave the house, did they have enough food? They, you know, made sure that they weren't completely socially isolated by, you know, social distance, masks and protective gear, just chatting with people for a few minutes and then asking them to think about the vaccine, giving information to them, letting them know that like one of the vaccines one of the major scientists who worked on it was a black woman and like all of this sort of was done through just grassroots community efforts just talking to people and just we have these powers this is what i'm trying to say is like a lot of people get really stressed out about thinking about say things like climate change social inequality food insecurity infrastructure issues because we, we try to think about it on like the universal scale all at once. And that makes it a lot more stressful. There's another element to this, which is uh, has to do with sort of like whiteness and white culture. I know this sounds like it's coming out of left field. I mean, not really if you like say a lot of things I post on the internet, but um, one of the things is that in whiteness, and whiteness doesn't just mean having white skin. You can have white skin and not be like capital W white, and you can have not white skin and be part of capital W whiteness. It's more of like this cultural mindset and way of approaching the world that I'm talking about. We have a tendency to think about things on either the individual level or the universal level. And very rarely do we think about things on a collective level. So it's one of the reasons why a lot of people are really comfortable with, say, talking about racism in the abstract rather than, hey, within our office, what are the things that are making people of color feel less welcome? And that's also true of things like homophobia. We are 
comfortable about talking about homophobia on a universal level or like hyper individual as long as it's not about me kind of thing. And I think that also applies to organizing and applies to ta how we tend to think about tackling bigger social issues that's either super individual, I'm in it alone, what can I do as an individual, oh my goodness, this is terrible, or we think about it on a universal level, which is like, if everything isn't solved everywhere all at once, it's a disaster and it's not good and there's a big problem and it's insurmountable. And I think we can think about more local identity. And this is also part of a sense of place, right? Like this is, this is not a failing of white people and whiteness in particular, in this sense. It is a failing of whiteness, but not individuals. It's more of like our sense of community and our shared community identities and our, you know, uh, collective level identities were stripped away from us as part of how we became quote unquote white. Uh, academic Foxhole Trooper SPJ talks about this, or SJP, for some reason I always reverse those two letters, uh, <laughs> talks about this a lot, about how, you know, white ethnics had to give up their culture, their sort of collective level identity in order to become part of whiteness. And that's both true in Europe and outside of Europe. Um, Yes, and Reverend Moore, it sounds like the answer is to think of things collectively, like some sort of communalism, Marxist air horns, I love it. So this is one of those things, though, is this is also a trauma, right? Like us having to historically give up these aspects of our identity and assimilate in these ways and like disconnect from like deep cultural memory and senses of shared identity is traumatic. I mean, a lot of like news reporting, it's almost there when they're talking about things like mass shooters being like lonely and isolated and like the world being so you know whatever and poor them if we don't have any sense of collective identity it makes it a lot harder for us to see ourselves as part of any kind of group which makes it harder to think about systemic issues but it also makes it harder for us to place ourselves within a context and within a continuum and Part of what I want to talk about today is how parties can actually help with this. Good parties, parties that make people feel good and connect them with each other. They don't have to look like parties where you go and you stand awkwardly in the corner holding a red solo cup, just being like, okay, I'm not drunk enough to go talk to anybody, uh, but I'm, I'm too drunk to like follow the jokes or whatever. Um, yes, this is all inspired by this one picture. So moving on to the next one. The rest of the good chunk of these memes are just funny. All right, this one I definitely related to this morning. It's a remix of one of Shen comics, and he's got this big brain with even veins bulging out of his hair, and he says, I just had an energy drink. And this dude says, so you're awake now? And then he replies, I'm tired faster. And uh, I relate to that. I relate to that hard. <laughs> um, let me actually move this over so I can see the chat. All right, this next one, I'm going to zoom in. It's Uber Facts. It's tweeted, reading for just six minutes can reduce stress by 68%. I hate facts like this. It's random statistics, no citations. Is this percent, percentage points? What are you talking about here? Uh, I, mm. Anyway, setting that aside, the Frogman <laughs> replied, I just read the Wikipedia entry for Camel Spriders and it did not help. Please advise. It's good. It's funny. It's funny. Um, all right. Matthew Tanner wrote, recipes should include photos of the mess you have to clean up after cooking. And I agree. I like hard agree because it's part of informed consent. I need to know what I'm getting myself into uh, before I try a new recipe. I would really like... For recipes to include the mess you have to clean up afterward. That would be great. All right, the next one here is a D&D &D meme and I like it. Uh, I think this is from Tumblr. I don't know what this ever is. This particular 
looks like reblogs. It looks like Tumblr, but I'm not 100% sure. Uh, probably bad RPG ideas said, instead of rolling dice, buy a copious amount of Chinese fortune cookies. Every time you need to roll, read aloud your fortune and let the DM decide what it means. And then piece of candy corn replied, DM, eat for initiative. Everybody reaches into a large bowl of fortune cookies at the center of the table. Uh, the guy who is way too eager, it says, every flower blooms in its own sweet time. DM, you go last. <laughs> yep, I like it. I like it. I mean, I love role-playing games. I love Dungeons and Dragons. Um, and I love to play around with them and, like, do creative things and be silly. I think this would be fun. All right, another D&D meme or Twitter post. This is from Devious Nightmare Woman. AKA Sarah is coffee. Don't let anyone lie to you. D&D is only about two things. One, traumatic backstory. Two, having a little pet. And I feel like that's also very accurate. Um, yeah. Everybody, I'm, I've been in the campaign for a while and uh, we all had hardcore backstories. <laughs> Hilariously though, my partner and I, without consulting with each other or even remotely being aware of it, wrote almost the exact same backstory. <laughs> like, I was uh, an uh, elf fighter, uh, like a wood elf fighter, and I wrote that I was part of, like, a commune, and then, like, these people came from outside, and they wanted to clear-cut our forest, and we had to fight them, and yada yada and my partner wrote that he was uh, a gnome and it was part of a commune and these people came in from outside and wanted to steal their natural resources then they had to fight and it was very funny when we all shared our backstories because my partner and I were just like what <laughs> um and it was uh it was pretty good pretty good <laughs> Rune weren't you said my favorite D&D &D backstory is the one that's entirely full of healthy parental relationships, stable relationships, and wholesome life goals. Yeah, those are also really nice. I mean, in my character's backstory, I have healthy family relationships. We're not, like, the same. My character's backstory is that I grew up in, like, a druid enclave, and my parents were, like, the head of it, but it's also basically a sex cult, and they have tons of orgies, and uh, it gets weird. So I, like, kind of understand druidic, but I'm not a druid. I'm a fighter. And I'm not, I was like, God, mom, I'm not going to go to another one of these parties kind of thing. Um, you're right, Kremlin. Well-adjusted people don't set out to become murder hobos. You're absolutely right. Uh, all right, next meme. This one I also got to zoom in. It's a dude, it's four panels, dude looking at a book, reading what's in the book, and then... Uh, <laughs> Reverend Mark, quote, basically a sex call, lots of orgies, it gets weird, end quote. Yeah, like I said, healthy and wholesome. Yeah, I mean, it's been great, because then, like, uh, there were these, like, rubber suits that we found at one point, and these, like, uh, automata, and, like, electricity is clearly involved, and I was like, oh, yeah, these look like the full body condoms people put on to have sex with lightning elementals, so, like... Probably this is to make it so you don't get electrocuted by these machines. It's great. It gives me, like, the ability to just, like, know things and have good ideas. It's fun. It's very fun. Um, even though I don't try to make every story in D&D &D being about sex, a lot of the time it ends up being that way. <laughs> um, you know, it's just creativity. Okay, every ADHD self-help book ever. The title of the book is How to Harness Your ADHD. Inside it says, use timers, make a list, very long paragraphs of coping mechanisms for being more, quote, neurotypical, and then just concerned face. And it's true. So many books, so many articles, so many things about, like, if you have ADHD, how to do better about it. It's just like, don't have ADHD. <laughs> and it's like, well, sure. If timers worked, I would have been using them. <sighs> anyway, moving on. Okay. David Polanski wrote on Twitter, I don't wish to sound apocalyptic about this, but one has 
the sense that at present our society is simultaneously characterized by widely disproportionate accountability for trivial transgressions and zero accountability for profound institutional failure. So this is one that like isn't as relevant to a lot of the things we've been talking about and a little off theme from the other things we've just been discussing. Um, but I really like this because it's a big problem I see in a lot of communities where like you have something small go wrong, like some conflict comes up, completely normal, healthy conflict, and then people want to run these big accountability processes and like have accountability pods and like, or you get into cancel culture or whatever, and like people want all of this stuff for and they want to call completely normal and healthy conflict like this is abusive and i've encountered that i've been i've had times where i've told people like hey this thing is kind of ableist please don't do that and them tell me i'm an abuser for telling them that i'm like cool story bro i don't know what to say to you as a response to that and on the flip side there's often other layers of things going on that we just kind of gloss over. So one of the things that ends up being a big part of, say, transformative justice, and if you don't know, transformative justice and restorative justice came out of Black and Indigenous cultural thought, and they're actually both quite different, and they are sort of alternatives to punitive justice and carceral models of justice, and they take a long time to really understand most people's understanding of them comes from social media and occasional think pieces or blog posts rather than like being really deeply embedded in the way of thinking about things. Um, you also have things like, you know, Scandinavian open prisons and stuff. Very interesting models of how to do things differently. Um, but in transformative justice, one of the things that's really important is that the transformation is supposed to happen at all levels. So like the person who experienced harm in some way, they're responsible for their own healing. They can get help and support, they can get guidance, they can get resources. They can't put their healing on anyone else. Only they can do it. Um, and this is a big part of like preventing accountability abuse, which is saying, you person who harmed me have to do everything I want until I feel better. And one of the problems with transformative justice or accountability is that the person who harmed you changing and becoming a better person what is possible but is unlikely to make you feel better like it's just not what we often think it will but that's not what's going to make us feel better it's great when it happens but it doesn't tend to make us feel better okay so the next level is the person who caused harm they're responsible for finding out what happened why something was wrong, what led to things going wrong, how they need to change their behavior, or what they could have done differently, trying to make up for harm and make amends, potentially providing resources to the people that they hurt, and you know, accepting new boundaries from the community. The organization or the people who are sort of in the community at large, they also need to have a transformative process there. They need to look at like, what were the structures that were in place? What are the co cultural community norms that we created that facilitated this harm happening? Did we say keep excusing behavior we knew was not great and wait until it gets really bad? This is something I try to talk about in a lot of communities. If you've got someone who's say being accused of, um, you know, assault or, you know, intimate partner violence or any kind of thing like that, um, or just any kind of violence, they never just get there suddenly. You don't just like wake up one day and become that kind of person. Generally speaking, that person crossed thousands of thresholds in public view without getting pushback or not getting serious pushback or any kind of intervention from the people around them, which inevitably is read as endorsement or this is an okay way to behave. And this is not to excuse it. This is not to say, oh, the poor person who caused harm, they just didn't really know what they were doing. There are rare occasions where that's true. That's not what I'm trying to say. And this is 
a reason is not the same thing as an excuse, right? Reasons explain why something happened and then help you find ways to prevent it from happening again. An excuse says the behavior or the thing that happened was excusable, that there is a, you know, excusing reason for it. There is a something that explains it away to a satisfactory degree. These are two separate things. Anyway, um, and, you know, it's, the community needs to look at what were the things going on. And if harm is happening within a system or an institution or an organization, there's a whole nother level of transformation that has to happen for the people who are in power and in leadership. How have they facilitated this sort of thing? So, you know, if like, um, if we have, say, at an event, something racist is happening, and I'm the organizer of that event, I need to look at, one, what makes this racist things possible here? Am I, you know, advertising to the a group of people who are more likely to do these things? Am I, is my code of conduct not clear? Do I not have any sort of ways of ejecting people from my events? Uh, do the so volunteers not have enough training? But then I also need to look at how did I respond to the event? If I'm more concerned about no bad vibes and like don't cause conflict, you know, I don't wanna deal with this because I want my event to be just peace, love and light. Well, then it's clear I'm prioritizing certain people's comfort to the detriment of others. And I have to make a choice about that. Who do I want to have be the priority in my spaces? Who do I actually really wanna welcome here? And am I okay with the choice that I've made directly or indirectly? I know this is a lot of like organization theory of like, how do you, how are you a good event organizer or like subcultural community organizer? But it also tracks with a lot of other issues. And we tend to leave this last bit out, the ways in which we have to look at structures that were made. Reverend, what you said, the, that view of transformative justice ultimately kind of falls back on the presumptions of punitive transactional justice, hurt transgressor to please victim, and fix transgressor to please victim, both ultimately come down to focusing on transactional ways. And yeah, so like the, the model that I, follow and that at Consent Academy we tend to teach about is much more the like, how do I want to say this? Sometimes people hear the phrase like things should be victim-led or victim-centered. And to me, what that means is that if the community is providing resources to say the person who caused harm, they need to make sure they're providing at least as many resources to the person who was harmed. And not just expect the person who was harmed to just be like fine and go off into the woods and whatever. Are they being given a way to feel safe to reintegrate into the community and not pushing them to go at a speed that is not healthy or comfortable for them and not, and like making room for things like, you know, trauma responses or not having great emotional regulation for a while after harm or anything traumatic or stress, really stressful occurs to us, for about six months to a year, it's not uncommon for people to be not quite themselves and to have a harder time with emotional regulation and have a harder time with sort of uh, proportional responses to any kind of thing going on in their life. And so they're gonna need space for that and they're gonna need support. And to me, that's what it means to be like victim-centered or victim-led. It's not, we're going to do whatever this person wants. Because one, that's also not very trauma-informed because it expects that person to know what they want all the time and to know what's, say, best for the person who caused them harm and to be able to make those decisions. There's a lot of pressure to put on one person. I don't really like it. A lot of people misunderstand it, I think. Anyway, this is relevant also, though, to looking at these big social issues we're talking about. How are we organizing society? Are, do we actually take like a sort of systems thinking approach? Are we looking at everything in all levels 
to see how are we getting here and then what do we actually need to do to change these things. Okay, continuing forward, this meme is knocking on wood that we don't actually have nuclear war, but it's uh, from Jimmy Neutron, and it's one of his friends every day, every time at uh, Show and Tell always brings the same thing, but it's been photoshopped of Putin's head and he's holding a nuclear weapon, and Putin says, this is a nuclear weapon. And the teacher says, Vladimir, this is the ninth week in a row you've shown a nuclear weapon in class. I just thought it was funny <laughs> because it's like, you know, scare tactics, et cetera, et cetera. Hopefully we don't actually get to that point where they do actually use these weapons. Um, dark humor gets me through sometimes. <laughs> okay, the next one's a trolley meme, trolley problem meme. Uh, one track is completely empty. The other track has a bunch of people tied to it. And it says, you can throw the switch at any time, but then you won't be able to use the threat of the trolley to fundraise anymore. Yes. Just going to leave that there. And you're right, Reverend Moore. Typical, it's funny because it's true. <laughs> yes. Okay, this one also made me laugh. So this is, it seems like a tweet from someone named WordCubed. And it's a... Uh, sort of like political uh, alignment chart where you have at the top authoritarian and then in the bottom libertarian and then on the left you have economic left and on the right you have economic right and the theme is people being mean to me is and you have like a CIA, FBI, op, cancel culture, gaslighting, and Orwellian and if you're right in the middle it's just uncivil and yeah. For me, I usually just say it's either there's something I should learn from whatever they're saying to me. Uh, usually there's some of that, even when the bigger messages are wrong, or it's just annoying. <laughs> but uh, I like this. I like this chart. I like this chart. It's, re it's also related to the, the organizing stuff we were just talking about. Anyway, continuing on. This is totally different. I know I'm all over the place today. Like I said, hot mess of a day, <laughs> of a week so far. I mean, it's only Tuesday, but mm, feels like the 11th Wednesday in a row. Okay, <laughs> Georgina Kirsten wrote on Twitter, conservative Mormon mom talk is crashing and burning because turns out a whole group of them were secretly swingers and one of the moms just spilled all this tea. And this tweet was just from the other day. Uh, this one's pretty funny because it doesn't surprise me. Uh, a lot more people are into a lot more kinky sex and whatever than most people realize. Um, it's not that hard to get involved in these kinds of groups. You just usually there's a meetup group for it or there's a club or there's like a, a WhatsApp group. Anyway, uh, my thought about this is we just need more sex positivity. If it weren't so sex negative, it wouldn't be so much drama. Uh, but yeah, I'm not into swinging because I'm too picky about who I'd want to have sex with. <laughs> All right, this one is more in line with the kinds of things I normally share at the beginning of these streams. And it's just a picture of just, just highway, ugh. It's there's like 20 lanes. Of, of highway and Americans be like gas prices are too high and then it says my brother in Christ you made the car dependent infrastructure see this is one of those things where it's like it's okay for cars to exist it's okay for us to like cars to use cars on occasion everything you know I love road trips I went on a road trip a couple of years ago and that vacation still sustains me I still think about it all the time as being really great. Um, and I really loved it. And road trips and certain contexts in which cars are really useful, these can all be great. The problem comes down to the fact that we've, we've made it the default mode of transportation for so much of the world. And we've made it so that there's often no other option. Hi, Ice Bunny. 
welcome. And this means that when things like gas prices skyrocket, people have a lot less agency and a lot less ability to make decisions for themselves and a lot more struggle because if you have no choice but to buy gas because you the only real option you have to make your life possible is to drive places then you're kind of out of luck i'm sure you all know this but like it doesn't have to be this way it just doesn't have to be this way okay this meme, also good, it is some screenshots from the uh, Robin Hood, the furry Robin Hood Disney movie, um, and it's about police officers, and it, the quote at the top is, if their job isn't to protect you, what do police even do? We have no-knock raids, so it's like the sheriff of Nottingham. No-knock raids, favor the rich and powerful at your expense, power opposing, civil forfeiture, using their sidekicks by getting their sidekicks by using deadly force against the unarmed, violently suppressed dissent. Police are more, it's more about protecting property than stopping crime. Um, yeah, I've never had a situation where police were quote unquote needed, where I called the police and I did not actually just make the situation worse or was a waste of time. Um, like situations where people are being mugged at like knife point or gun point. The cops assumed I was misunderstanding what was happening. Uh, just showed up late by the time they got there, everything was over and they just got mad at the person who was robbed, that kind of thing. Uh, Ice Bunny, the subject today, we're actually going to read the book Surviving the Future in just a minute. Uh, I've just been chit-chatting about some memes. <laughs> um, and Reverend Mort, ah, oh, yes, the logic of cops don't protect or serve. They enforce the law. The law doesn't serve anyone but those in power. And it's true. Hi, Critwitch. All right. And then we got one last meme. One last meme before Surviving the Future. Hello, Aradin. Um... We have here a bunch of people clasping arms in solidarity. We have bodily autonomy is at the center, and we have disability rights, trans rights, reproductive rights, intersex rights. I mean, autonomy is the foundation of everything, not just our model of consent at Consent Academy, and it's not just bodily autonomy. It's all types of autonomy. It's essential. It's essential. All right, let's read some Surviving the Future. Thank you all for bearing with me while I wanted to blow off some steam with memes. It helped. I got to talk about some of my stresses without having to directly talk about them. Um, Ice Bunny said, okay, then I do not need to type my fingers bloody with a freak show story that happened to me when I was 16. I mean, you can do that if you want to. I will not stop you. Uh, but you do not have to. Okay, so we were talking about carnival and the benefits of it, and we also talked about it being like a ritual and how it helps people blow off steam and it creates this transformation and, you know, it, it kind of takes people out of the difficulties of daily life because a lot of daily life is difficult. Like, life is great. It's good. There's so many wonderful things about it. And in the end, it's also really tough. Um, so, okay. One, one thing to go back to because I didn't really mention it. This is a great example about autonomy through solidarity. All of these different groups might feel that they have really, really, really different uh, things that they're fighting for. And I think about a lot of, like, say, feminists who are trans exclusionary, not recognizing that by fighting against trans rights, they're also undermining bodily autonomy at its very source. And that, like, this is a place where we should actually be in solidarity with each other. And it should go in both directions, you know, like 
even if trans women don't have to worry about, you know, access to abortion for themselves personally, the more women in general, cis or otherwise, are have their bodily autonomy infringed upon, it also affects trans rights. And intersex people get completely left out of this discussion a lot of the time, but they're definitely right there. And anybody with a disability. So through solidarity and through cooperation and through organizing together, we can actually increase in our agency and protect our autonomy. And at a co remember the early problem we talked about is that a lot of times people, especially certain types of people, think about things only in the individual level and the universal level, and we forget about the collective level. We don't have conversations at the collective level. We don't go through all of this, but by talking about things at the collective level, by solidarity, by organizing together, we have so much more power. And it doesn't have to be universal collective level. It can be local as well. And uh, hello, Kurt Witch. Hello, Aradin. You said they are missing the word at the end of to protect and serve, that word being themselves. I agree. Okay, surviving the future. We didn't get through these sort of benefits here of carnival. So I'm going to just back up and just say, read from right here, and then we're going to look at some of these benefits. So there is in Carnival a quality of exuberance which distinguishes it from the sedate proceedings, which we would usually understand as ritual, but it possesses nonetheless ritual seven properties. So first one is membership. Ritual is a meeting, regular meeting place, and taking part in it affirms that the participants are members of the community. Communities need to have some reason for getting together. If that reason is a myth with no practical function, nothing is lost. What matters is the getting together. In carnival, the sense of membership is often deepened by dance, once a central expression of religions, including Christianity. Dance is synchronized, interactive, and requires people to engage with and sometimes even touch each other. It is also both active and passive or perhaps somewhere in between. There is a sense of being willingly swept up in doing something dramatic and beautiful without having to make decisions about it. For the resilient communities of the past, dance was no mere entertainment. It was a key expression of membership. So here the point is festivals like ritual help create a sense of membership. It helps create that collective level identity that a lot of us have lost at this point. A lot of the time we see it mostly represented through things like nationalism. I'm an American, whatever, go America, woohoo. Like we get that level of collective identity, but that doesn't really get us what we're really looking for because nationalism type collective identity is a sort of obliteration of the self under the sort of idea of the state. And rather than an expansion of the self and an affirming of the self through seeing it reflected in those with whom you share an interdependence. And so this is one of those big deals here is that like a sense of membership to a group is really important. I think that's why a lot of us who struggle with finding that in our daily lives, I mean, I think most of us do because we've set society up to really not facilitate this, but some of us feel it really keenly, seek membership in groups in online communities because we want to belong and we want to be able to share. And it's tough because it doesn't get us there all the way. We don't get all the way a lot of the time. The sharing that comes with it, the, the sort of like ritual element, the cr shared creation element, the interdependence, the ability to really like help their help each other in more than one off ways on occasion to really be there th with each other and for each other over time. Um, Ice Bunny, you said, how much of sharing is okay if we make the point that festivals should be 
for the locals that are part of the culture. In Denmark, the concept of Oktoberfest is reduced to tacky get drunk fest. Yeah, so there's another um, article book that I've, let me just open it up. Um, where is it here? Sorry, I have like a million, a million links open. Uh, this book here is about um, festivals, tourism, and social change. And I looked at this a little bit last time, but the festivals that actually are good for local people and for communities are ones that are by and for the communities and bring people together, not just like touristy, you know, random excuse to get drunk. Those, I mean, those can be fun and debauchery and sort of like, you know, uh, hyperindulgence. But when it's in a super individualistic sense versus like a shared context, it doesn't tend to produce the same results. And festivals that um, uh, are by and for the local community and are of the local community, not just like a, or even ported Oktoberfest because it's fun to get drunk, but are really of the people in this area tend to be what we're talking about. Because you're absolutely right, Ice Bunny, the tacky get drunk fest, it's not gonna really produce these things that we're talking about. Okay, a little bit more here. Emotional daring. The way emotion multiplies when shared is poignantly illustrated in a reflection by the French historian Jules Michelet, who, as a child, was kept away from the carnival. My childhood never blossomed in the open air, in the warm atmosphere of an amiable crowd, where the emotion of each individual is increased a hundredfold by the emotion felt by all. When a group shares an emotion with you, it is likely that you will be able to feel it with more intensity and insight, or at least with more confidence than you could alone. Personal joys and sorrows are placed within the context of collective joys and sorrows. You can feel emotionally uplifted by the exultant music of the Messiah or the Great Harvest Psalm. Strong bonds can be built in a community that is encountered at such depth. A community which not only feels the same emotion as you do, but enhances it is a community you feel you can trust. And there is an ecstatic quality about being happy among other happy people. It sometimes happens when playing in the snow. So two things that really come to mind here for me is like the scene from Midsummer. If you haven't seen Midsummer, only watch it if you like scary and gory movies. Um, but there's a scene, uh, this is a very mild spoiler, one of the main characters, she sees something uh, to do with her boyfriend that just breaks her heart. It really upsets her and she starts crying and she kind of goes back to her room and she's really having a freak out. And all these other women who live in this like remote village come and they surround her and they it reflect her emotion back to her and they cry and they sob and they wail with her. Now, in the context of this film, this is sort of being used as a psychological manipulation tactic to sort of indoctrinate her into this cult sort of way of thinking about things, but it is also an incredibly powerful experience to like experience strong emotions, be encouraged to express them strongly, and then have them shared and reflected back at you and not just expressing it at a wall or having it rejected or being told control it or calm it down. I mean, think about in our daily lives, how often are we afforded the opportunity to not only feel very strong emotions, but then express them openly and unreservedly. And then the next level, know that we will not face any kind of rejection or dismissal or judgment for those feelings. That's pretty rare. We're often, and this is not every culture, but a lot of cultures, expected to keep a lot of that stuff inside and not share it with others, which is a very isolating thing. It can be important in some contexts. It's not always appropriate to be trying to process big emotions in every moment. Sometimes something else needs to be the priority or the focus, or if we did it all the time, it would maybe derail things. But having this opportunity 
to really feel your feelings in a deep and intense way and then share them with others in a sense of safety at self-expression is incredibly powerful. And I would honestly guess most of us have never really even experienced that. Maybe we've experienced it with, say, one other person, but not to this level. I think a lot of the times the closest thing we get is like if we go see a comedian and we're all in a sort of ritual space of laughing together and enjoying this sort of entertainment and we're expressing laughter, but even there, there are rules and limits on it. If I find a joke funny and I get into a really loud giggle fit and I can't stop laughing, people are probably going to expect me to leave the room until I calm down. It will not be something that is then shared with me and other people and then reflected back to me. It's isolating in its way. Okay. Um, I see a couple comments in chat, so let me back up. Um, Crit, which you wrote, I wonder if some of this is the subconscious reason why I have become far less nationalist. Also realizing that it was used to recruit youth to military service. Yeah. Um, Krellen, I think that everything boils down to this. When the only goal of your society is profit, you get a pretty crappy society. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, Aradin, you wrote, nationalism is all about the sublimation of the self to the nation, often at the expense of the individual for the enrichment of the leadership. That sounds kind of like the experience of watching a movie at the theater, the shared emotional experience. Yeah. And Ice Bunny, I just feel that Bavaria is seen as stereotypical German overseas. My Japanese friend was surprised that the north of Germany was not coming close to what the guidebook ex explained Germany was. Yeah, that doesn't surprise me. Um, yeah. I mean, I think it's also one of the issues with like tourism, especially tourism around these sort of like cultural products and festivals. Um, you also say, I funny, as someone from the Danish minority in Germany, I am constantly the majority's other. In Germany, I am the Dane, and in Denmark, the German. That is the only on the planet responsible for what happened in the 30s and 40s. Difficult. Yeah, being in this kind of in-between is difficult, for sure. Um, and it makes that social belonging really hard, and it makes the sort of, like, different levels of identity more complicated. Absolutely. All right. Um, the other one I was thinking of, so we had Midsummer, and then, uh, oh, like Pentecostals and stuff, like people uh, in these sort of like ecstatic religious spaces, um, speaking in tongues, dancing, writhing on the ground, falling, laying on of hands, this kind of thing. There's a reason why the social bonds in these groups tend to be so unbreakable and where so much, is, it, there's so much cohesion and solidarity there because it, that's in a powerful experience. As a kid, I had a friend who is Pente or who still is Pentecostal and I went to church with her uh, every Sunday for like a couple of weeks very much just out of curiosity and I had asked ahead of time the like pastor if this was okay because I just wanted to learn and experience it and the first time I was there and people started speaking in tongues and like writhing on the ground and dancing with snakes I was like it's kind of terrifying <laughs> I don't know how to feel about this and it my immediate assumption was that this was all fake like everyone was just like choosing to do this and like none of this is really real I learned more later that like it's more complicated than that. And like the, the social power can really take over and make things that seem absurd completely natural for people. It's like the placebo effect, except at a societal level um, rather than an individual level or a group level. Uh, it's intense, it's intense. Not my thing, um, but for the people who get things out of it, I'm happy for them. For sure. Okay, let's read just a couple more um, before we go to Stardew Valley. We have here continuity. 
the unchanging quality of ritual bears out beliefs and hopes about the permanence of the community. The same music, dance, and choreography, the way we do it here, handed down between generations and evolving slowly, if at all. It is a symbol of continuity, a stable code for the community. So I want to stop here for a moment because a lot of people feel, an, I think, an immediate rejection of this idea of like the way we do it here. Because this is often, most often heard when people are trying to explain away some kind of bigotry or other forms of discrimination or exclusion of like, well, we just do it this way here and we can't question it. That's not what this person is talking about. It's more like um, in indigenous communities, oral tradition is inc often incredibly important. You know, we have historical records, like the, the tribes that live near Crater Lake National Park and who that area was their historical land before the national park was created. Their oral traditions, more than 10,000 years, explain exactly how Crater Lake was formed incredibly accurately. Scientists didn't believe them for a long time, and then geologists came and like got a clear picture of what happened, and it matched the record, including the timeline, very, very well. And this sort of thing happens over and over and over again within, you know, cultures that have strong oral traditions, which is most um, North American indigenous groups. Oral tradition was the backbone of how you carry the continuity of your people and not changing the story and being really good at preserving exactly how things happened is essential to the community knowing how do we do things? How do we handle this kind of situation? Where do we come from? What created this sort of thing? To make sure that information doesn't get lost and it can be incredibly accurate. So similarly with like any kind of ritual or sacred sort of experience or way of doing something like say how this kind of art is made or how this kind of cloth is created, those sorts of things also being ritualized and having strong continuity, it's very, very powerful. You know, I don't talk about it that often, but um, I am uh, an ordained Buddhist monk in the Japanese Shingon sect, and it's a very physical lineage of Buddhism. It's very much like an in-the-body kind of thing, and there's a lot of very physical ritual to it. And there's a lot... Knowing that the way I do the chanting that I do, being very continuous and connected to this long lineage and that like I'm connected through my Dharma master and his Dharma master and so on and so forth back, you know, 1200 years at least is a very powerful feeling. And it's, it has a huge ability to create a sense of, of transformation and like change of a brain state. Like, when doing the chanting from this like special book that we have, I'm gonna show you the book because I have it here. These two. So this is the the red book that we do our, our chanting from, and you can see here the it's a very traditional style of sort of an accordion book, and then you can see here sort of this. This is singing notation, right? Like this is music. And this is about how you're supposed to sing. And obviously this is completely different from modern musical notation. And it's, you know, not changing it and it being really uh, as close to the original as possible is powerful. And it's just the ritual act of doing this kind of chanting, like, it's incredibly powerful and also, you know, scientifically backed. It's vagal toning. Chanting has a huge impact on the vagus nerve and your body's ability to self-regulate and feel at peace and calm. So anyway, um, this continuity is powerful. So I, the, the way we do it here, 
the author's not trying to talk about like, we're not going to change our bigoted ways because we've always done it this way. It's more this idea of like deep memory, deep cultural memory, deep memory of the land, deep memory of yourselves throughout time. And this idea here of the permanence of the community, the idea that even after you are gone, this way of being will continue, that you are part of this very clear tapestry that will continue throughout time also makes things like death a lot less scary because you're like, well, it's not about me. I'm part of this larger picture and that picture is not dying. It's only this one part that has its place and then it ends. They're very powerful things. Anyway, finishing this part up, as the anthropologist Marie Splotch notes, the ritual locates a particular social order in its setting as a fact of the nature of the world. This differentiates it from the daily scenes and politics of the moment. It is present, its presence is real, dependable, reassuring. It is there on its own terms, something to which the individual can defer. The shaman or priest in the early religions who changed the ritual or lit liturgy broke the spell and would be in trouble, perhaps at risk of his life. The rules and practices confer timeless legitimacy on the community. It has the courage of its conventions. I know this is kind of a weird concept for a lot of people, but it does have this incredible power. And it does have an incredible power on these other levels, the pure rit ritual, the idea of membership, knowing I'm doing something the same way people have done something for thousands of years. You know, another example of this is when I lived in France, I lived in Southern France and there's more intact Roman ruins in Southern France than there is in like all of Italy. And you can go to an actual real Roman amphitheater and sit in the same seats that ancient Romans sat in and watch the same comedy that they watched and laugh at the same jokes. And to me, that's an incredibly powerful experience knowing that I still think the same thing is funny that somebody like more than a thousand years ago, 2000 years ago, thought was funny. And I'm sitting in the same place as them. And that's just an incredible thing. It's this, takes you outside of the sense of just this individual self that is fragile and isolated and alone and impermanent and makes you realize it's so much bigger than all of that. And this is kind of what this is talking about. Uh, Ice Bunny, you said, YouTube once suggested Friday Shabbat service to me and I am now stuck. It's so nice, I do not understand what they sing or why, and it sounds nice and so joyful. Krellin, it's why the prayers of Mecca are at the same time of day for all Muslims, so that even when a Muslim is alone, they know that they're joined in prayer by the entire Muslim community. Exactly, exactly. And I mean, like, this doesn't have to be an explicitly religious context, right? Like the example I gave of the Roman plays. It doesn't have to be explicitly religious. Religion is just one of the ways this has survived because colonialism, capitalism, all of these machinations of things have destroyed a lot of this, but we can bring it back. Just religion has done a better job of maintaining these ideas here. And so that really is a big thing. We can also see this in say like the British royal family and like how things are done there and like how coronation is done and you know, like all of these different things it confers a lot of legitimacy on there because these rituals are unchanged and because the way of doing things is the way that things are done, etc. Okay, let's read one more. I just wanna read Consciousness of Time and Events because this one is really relevant to Stardew Valley and not just because there's a picture of someone farming here. Consciousness of Time and Events the progression of the year and events in the community and the lives of its members are noticed and affirmed by ritual and rites of passage. The event is marked. It takes place in the mind as well as in the environment. This is important. The major experiences of our lives are often in the world as it is now, almost entirely internal. And there might be some like external byproduct, like 
you know, first time you menstruate or um, first time you have a wet dream or something, right? Like that's in its own way, like rites of passage and puberty. And there is like a physical byproduct from that, except when AFABs have a wet dream, I don't, there's not usually a physical byproduct. Um, and if you didn't know, AFABs can also have wet dreams. Um, there's, we don't have a lot of these things that mark these big transitions in life. We have some, we have like weddings and we have funerals and maybe have like baby showers and stuff. And those are great. Like that, those in many ways are really important, but we don't have that many. And they're all also often really commercialized and like have persisted largely because they create a lot of profit and they encourage a lot of money to be spent. But imagine just being in a way, place where you really could feel the rhythm of time and the rhythm of life around you. Like one of the things I love about this window here, it's gone down a little bit because there was this rooftop garden that had these really beautiful trees right over there that they all chopped down and it broke my heart because they also did it during the middle of spring and summer, which is like, you're going to create so many refugee birds and like really displace a whole bunch of communities because there's this huge, it was a great biodiversity hub. Some of it's moved over here. I've got this great tree here. I've got some bird feeders out there. But one of the things I like that has helped me feel more connected to this place where I live is I can see that depending on the time of year it is, different birds come to my bird feeders. And it's a very small thing, but it helps me feel the passage of the year and feel where I'm located in the land here. And so that's really powerful, but we could go way beyond that. And feeling that there's this regular affirmation and validation of the passage of time, of life milestones, of accomplishments, of your place in community, being reflected around you is also a way to make you feel like you've got a stable hold on reality and that like you know what's going on and you know your place in things. Um, Aradna, a quinceanera uh, be the closest? You know, I think a quinceanera is also an example of this. Um, and it, it, it's another example, but it does also encourage a lot of money spending. Like my cousin's quinceanera uh, that I went to January of 2020 um, uh, was at a bit expensive hotel and we all bought fancy outfits for it and gifts and stuff and it yeah it encourages money spending but and I think that's one of the reasons why it's persisted okay Con continuing ritual celebrates the stories and events that made the community acknowledging seasons and accomplished tasks renewing members' awareness of their community's history and of the stories and traditions which give it identity. One, once local saints and heroes were remembered, the agricultural year was celebrated, rites of passage, baptism, adulthood, marriage, death were observed. A young man would be made explicitly conscious of becoming a full member of the community and of the responsibilities and duties conferred. Obviously this could apply to women as well and non-binary people of course the author has their own biases um ritual was the performative utterance that turned events into building blocks of a culture so this idea of like performative utterances and all of this this is a lot of stuff from like social theory and or uh social sciences and sociology and looking at like how culture is made and like social reproduction. Um, and so it's really important to know that like physical material productions of objects is a huge vehicle of culture, but so are performative acts and utterances and the things that we do, like saying, I promise being this big signifier of like, a huge cultural idea of like, what does it mean to then also break a promise or saying I do or uh, at, at a wedding and things like that. Like these are important and powerful things. Anyway, continuing. Uh, 
James Roos Evans comments on the barely visible remnant of these rites of passage. No wonder we undergo identity crises until we die. <laughs> And I'm going to leave here off on this quote, no wonder we undergo identity crises until we die. Because I think that this is a really great quote and a really important idea, and I want to play some game. Um, so thinking about this, even if you don't like nature, right? I, a couple weeks ago, someone brought up uh, when I was talking about connection to the land, like not everybody likes nature. And I really do want to stress, you don't have to like nature for this to still be a powerful thing. And you don't even have to be out in nature or working, though genuinely it is all nature, even a city is nature. It's just human modified nature. The way a beaver dam is nature or an ant colony is nature. It's all nature. <laughs> it's just nature really modified to the benefit of one species over the others uh, in a very big and impactful way. Anyway, uh, even if you don't like the sort of um, general conception of what it means when we say the word nature. Um, feeling connected to the world around you helps one with things like how most people think of mindfulness, of being really here, really present, really like arriving in spaces. I, I teach at a lot of like hippie kind of events um, and people often talk about how we want an extra day at the beginning so that everyone can really arrive. And that sounds to some people kind of silly, but it's a real thing. Like you need time to feel integrated into the spaces that you're in. It's why like when we get to work sometimes in the morning, it can take us a while before we actually start to be productive or useful because we need to arrive. Are out in nature found in the natural world? Question mark. I mean, it's all the natural. I mean, like every we're we're animals, and so like we're there's no ability for us to escape nature because we are part of nature. I mean, this is very philosophical. So you can totally feel free to disagree with me and say that you think that we're very much outside of nature. You would be well within a lot of philosophical traditions as well. I'm gonna move over to the gameplay screen. Um, I'm taking one philosophical stance, um, but I'm also a bit of an ass, so it's totally cool if you don't think that uh, my definition of nature is correct. Sorry, I'm just resizing the screen, resizing it to make it look pretty. All right, that's good enough. That's good enough. Okay, game time. So let's talk about party and also why the Stardew Valley parties kind of suck. Um, I love the sound effects. <laughs> Reverend Moore, you say philosophical stances aren't allowed, only philosophical dances? Well, shit. I'm not ready to dance. I'm not warmed up enough. I am ready, though, to put on my cowboy hat. Yes. I feel like this combo of my Tyco shirt and the cowboy hat reminds me of this meme uh, where people talk about how, like, what was happening in different parts of the world all over uh, at the same time where there was, like, gunslingers and there was, like, Victorian dudes and there was, like, samurai and there's always one other. I forget what the other one is. And they could all have, like, interacted at the same time. Uh, I feel like this is happening. Time period thing is hilarious. hilarious. Glad you, uh, I'm glad you knew what I was talking about because I was like, I don't understand myself at this moment and the words I'm using. Um, okay, Ice Bunny, you said some things. Let me look at what you said. Uh, you said, sorry, my ADHD brain had three not so cool symptom days, so I may not make much sense. Skull. Um, okay, well, like, never any pressure to make sense first of all like i don't think i make sense half the time i think a lot of the time i'm just kind of like yeah vibes let's talk about vibes pam is there okay i only got these quests going on oh wait i have another thing being built that's so exciting i'm very excited okay 
fortune teller. Very. Okay. All right. All right. Very displeased. It's fine. It's fine. Weather report. It's going to be clear and sunny all day tomorrow. Well, what do you know? Oh my goodness. So many things are happening. It's happening. Um, no, I want to open this because I need my watering can. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Water and can. Uh, I'm gonna put this. Oof. I want to see real quick if I can turn the sounds back on because I really like having the sounds on, and we'll just see. We'll just see. We'll just see. I'm just gonna put sound volume up and the music volume up. We'll see if it's terrible or not. If it gets crunchy, we'll see. Because I love the sounds in this game and I miss them. Um, all right, let's get some of this. Got an egg, gonna put an egg in there. We are enabling Pam's substance dependency. It's true. Um, it's true, what can I say? <laughs> you know, it's just, if Pam feels okay about it and has got things under control, uh, I mean, she's allowed to make her own decisions. You're allowed, this is a very controversial statement, you're allowed to be addicted to drugs if you want. Um, you know, people often talk about, oh, people just don't want to work. Yeah, I can hear the sound, but no music. Let me, let me fix it. There might not be music at the moment, but uh, people just don't want to work. Blah, blah, blah. It's terrible. No one wants to work. And like, oh, people who use drugs, they're just going to waste away life. And I don't, I don't even know. Lots of people have lots of thoughts and feelings about everything all the time. Um, and uh, first of all, I would argue that it's very rare that there are people who just like actually don't want to work and would refuse to do so. Like I think a lot of us would for a time and then would be horribly bored and want a source of meaning. And if we had healthier community and healthier sort of, I faced the wrong direction, spaces, things would be different and potentially better and people would be ha healthier and we'd have less of this problem. But then also like one, you know, uh, you have the right to not want to work and Two, uh, you know, I don't know. I don't know. I just think that it would be very, like, if somebody wants to just do nothing and, like, drink and eat food and relax all the time, like, sure, they're allowed to have that sometimes. And we shouldn't. I know I'm digressing, and I'm not even talking about Pam exactly, because I know Pam, it's supposed to be that sort of Pam and uh, Shane struggle with alcoholism and Shane especially, and uh, I'm not trying to explain that away or anything, more just trying to say other things about other situations. Um, you're right, Arad, and the music uh, might come when I switch scenes. And Krellen, you said, uh, that's true, people don't want to work, that's why we call it work. Yeah, my favorite French word is the word for working because the etymology of it actually means to suffer. <laughs> uh, and I love that. I love that. You know, um, just like, you know, the word villain, the etymology of villain is a peasant who's not free. Like they're, they're bonded to a manorial estate and like was poor. Uh, so villain, the word that means bad guy now used to just mean people who were technically not free and had to work uh, and didn't own anything. And we mean bad guy <laughs> now. It's, you know, etymology is interesting. Uh, so many eggs. Wow, I've just been leaving them around. I wanna get a duck. I wanna get a duck. I wanna get a duck and some sheeps and some cows. Um, and, you know, Krillin, we're not entitled to the work of others. 
it's true. I mean, like, there's always the idea of balancing between, you know, uh, individual wants and needs and group and collective wants and needs and, um, you know, being part of society and sharing responsibilities with each other and all that good stuff. And it's not always the most fun thing to think about. And also it can lead to a lot of sadness and sorrow because not everybody wants to deal with all of those responsibilities. And also just, uh, oh my gosh, my brain just stopped working. I'm sorry. <laughs> I literally just stopped working. I was like, yeah, I have something to say. And my brain was like, no, you don't. <laughs> No, you don't. You don't have anything to say. Oh my goodness. Why can't I get this? Okay. All right. Let's see here. I need two of these. I'm going to move this here. I'm going to bait these traps. If I can even get near this one. Oh my goodness. I tried to block all of that, and I still get these silly messages about buying followers. I don't care. I really just don't. I wouldn't want to be famous. I don't want to try that. Not interested. All right, I'm going to sell this golden pumpkin. Um, save the rest of that. Save the rest of that. Okay, put these things away. Yeah, quick mods. Thank you, whoever moderated that. All right, putting things away, putting things away. Arad, and you said, and now often the villains are the ones with the wealth and removing the freedom of others. Yep. It's, uh, and I agree with Kurt Rich, it's hilarious in a sad way. Because it's absolutely accurate. It's hilarious in a sad way. I'm gonna, all right, I gotta put these eggs up here. A lot of sorts, a lot of sorts. Thank you, Aradin. I really appreciate that. I really like to hang out with <laughs> Like really, it's, I was like kind of stressed out earlier. So I just had some conflict with a, uh, an event I'm supposed to work at that's run by people that I genuinely really like and want to be friends with and not totally up on some racism related things. And there's some resistance because they don't want to make people mad. And I'm like, okay, but you gotta, you gotta pick who you actually want to be at your events and like whose comfort you want to prioritize and who is it you're actually making space for and all that. And, uh, I don't want to have to deal with it, and it's sad and frustrating. And so I was like, blah, 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 today. And then hanging out with you all, I just feel fine now. <laughs> feel great. Okay, okay. What do I have to do? What do I need to get done right now in this game? Yeah, Ice Bunny. Oh, I know that feeling so well. It took me three days to push the emotional brain of the driver's seat in my brain to get me back to a level of calm to be normal again. Yeah, and you know, this, for me, even here, one of the frustrating things is that, like, this particular type of issue is an issue I've dealt with, like, so many times. Like, these conversations are conversations I've had with people, like, a bajillion times. And it's basically like, you know... How much appropriation are you comfortable with happening at your event? You know, there's no, very few people of color actually come. You've asked them why they don't come. And they've said it's because of appropriation. I myself last year was like, first time I went to teach and I was just like, cool, like, please change the name of your sex tent to not being a teepee, like teepees are sacred. And like, you know, if I went and made a tea, like I'm not from a tribe that makes teepees. If I like went and did that, it would also be really offensive. Like, and I like asked for all of these things and uh, they were pretty cool about it and didn't really know. And I don't begrudge them not knowing, but it's just, I've just had these conversations so many times and I'm tired of having them with people. And 
things can get personal sometimes. Things can get personal. And so I get, even though like intellectually, I'm like, whatever, like I know exactly how the conversation's gonna go and like, it'll be fine and blah, blah, blah. It's still stressful. All right, I'm gonna get this hazelnut, but I got a gold hazelnut and I'm definitely gonna give that to Elliot. Elliot Linus, Linus, Linus likes the forageables. I got two gold hazelnuts. That's nice. Woohoo, he liked the gift. Linus says, I've explored deep into the caves. They hold some hidden secrets. I just be cautious if you go in there. Yeah. I'm not going in there today. Demetrius, during this time of year, I divert my attentions to fungi. Yep, I'm going to talk to Sebastian. So it's the biggest harvest season, isn't it? Yes, it is. All right, let's do a little bit of fishing. I don't have too much going on today, so... Exactly, Krellin. <laughs> it is exactly how microaggressions work. No one of them is really worth getting upset over, but the sum total is exhausting. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, it, you know, I'm basically in a situation where it's like, okay, but if someone showed up wearing, like, a headdress, like a war bonnet, and I was uncomfortable with that and asked them to not do it, would the organizers of the event support me? Would they have my back? Or, like, would I be seen as equally responsible for the hostility and the bad vibes and the like? Anyway, anyway, it's like, ugh. and I like these people very much and think they're cool and also want to get paid to do things. So, and I get it, like, there's a really good, um, philosophy tube video. I mean, like, they're all amazing. But one of my favorite ones is on ignorance and the study of ignorance, agnotology, and the idea that, like, there are some things which, like, we cannot help but be ignorant of, things that are withheld from us. And then there are the things for which we consciously or unconsciously, intentionally or unintentionally choose to remain ignorant about. And with racism, that's often a thing where it's like, you know, maybe you don't know at one point or you don't know how deep it goes or you're not quite sure. But after a certain point of being told about it and being aware of it, not knowing more is a choice or like anything to do with, you know, uh, the fact that trans people exist and like heteronormivity. Sure, it's OK if like the first couple of times you're exposed to the idea of gender being more than men and women and more complicated than that you're confused and you don't understand and you think it's silly but then after a certain point in time there's a choice of choosing to not know more and not knowing more because maybe you don't want to find out more because then you would be required to make more choices one of the examples abigail gives in the video is that she has a lot of friends who are vegetarian and vegan, and they say to her, if you knew what goes into meat production, you would be miserable and not want to eat it anymore. And Abigail says, like, she believes them and she intentionally remains ignorant of it. And, like, I think because she doesn't, she wants to eat meat, she does not want to give up eating meat. She tried it before, made her miserable. You know, I don't think everybody's body responds to vegetarian and veganism very well. I know it's like, as someone who's been a vegetarian since I was a child, you know, I'm not the kind of person who's like, yeah, you're a bad person if you're not a vegan or a vegetarian. I'm just like, you know, not everybody's body likes that. Not everybody's body responds to that well. And also like, sure, like eating tons of meat every day is very recent trend and like, you know, not great for the environment on many levels, but like telling everyone to become a vegetarian is also, don't do that. <laughs> but like Abigail saying, like, she does expect that if she learned the truth about meat production, she would be so miserable that she wouldn't want it anymore. And she thinks that that's true and therefore does not want to find out more. And I think that there's, 
types of maintaining intentionally ignorant that are completely understandable, right? Like someone might think, okay, I think my spouse is cheating on me and I could try to find out, but if I found out, I, I, knowing would be worse than not knowing. Like I'd rather not know and just go about my life. Or it's the same with like getting a bunch of genetic tests, right? If you get certain genetic panels, they can tell you your risks of developing certain types of illnesses. And there's all these like ethical debates about like, is that actually good for people? Uh, how does that, in does that information actually help people or does it just create a different kind of stress and suffering? And these are really big questions, sure. And, you know, there's always the question of like relative risk versus absolute risk and like, you know, a percentage chance of de developing a certain type of cancer does not mean you're going to get cancer. I mean, cancer, I know I'm kind of going all over the place today, is largely a disease of aging. And like most of us that live to 90, 50% of us will develop some form of cancer. Like it's just a thing. And so like, just because you have like a slighter elevated risk, we think of certain genes with certain cancers that could just create a lot of stress in somebody's mind. I have a friend whose dad died very suddenly. And most likely the reason why he died was because he was trying too hard to prevent diabetes. Like he knew he had an elevated risk of developing diabetes type two. And so he was so careful to eat like a low glycemic index diet that it seems like he went into ketoacidosis, which was like having blood sugar that gets so low that your blood becomes too acidic and it kills you. And because he knew that he had this risk, it made him so much more miserable that it may have actually caused him to die. Because last year he just suddenly dropped dead and that's the only thing that seems, they didn't do an autopsy because there was not, like the insurance wouldn't have covered it, but it seems like that's what killed him um, from those like preliminary examinations. Anyway, ooh, midnight carp, okay. All right, uh, lots of things in chat. Hi, Kettlestick, welcome. Um, Ice Bunny, you said, I wonder if the Drendel and Lederhosen as a fashion is not one form of appropriation and it is out of the 16 parts of Germany where 15 do not care as much because it is not their local culture. Yeah, I mean, it, that's a good question. I think it's tough. I think a lot of people time, times people talk about appropriation in terms of like the power dynamics or like the history of oppression between groups of people. And there's a ton of history of internal colonization and oppression within Europe that is often overlooked in these questions. Um, and uh, Arad, and you said, it is also, I think, why anti-vaxxers kind of weaponize that discomfort to shut down discussion. To be honest, meat is also, yeah. <laughs> Krellen, I think uh, the thing about that vegan argument is that it isn't meat eating that they object to, it's factory farming. Meat processing doesn't have to exist at this, that scale and that scale of any agriculture is going to have things you don't like. I totally agree. I mean, like factory farms, industrial level things, that's where a lot of negative things come from in terms of environmental and health impacts of this farming. And, uh, if we don't have meat production at that scale, most of us are gonna eat meat a couple times a month because it would just be too expensive otherwise. Um, Aradin, when I was in university, a group made a song called Carrot Juice Constitutes Murder in relation to similar conversations. I think it was at least a little tongue in cheek. Okay, I was like, carrot juice is murder. Oh, and Darth Beeble, hello, welcome. Uh, it's funny. When I was at the hospital for my eating disorder, my doc said that if you do vegan wrong, it is as unhealthy as overeating on sweets. Absolutely. Kettlestick, I so often wish I could try becoming a vegetarian, but every time I try, I go back to eating meat really quickly. Darth Beeble, I think so much of being vegetarian is just better veggie cooking. Hi, <laughs> Kettlestick. Darth Beeble, I don't claim to be good but even a little bit of practice helps so much. Uh, 
and uh but i also think i have simple tastes um yes i there's people you are you know pretty good at cooking you make delicious vegetables <laughs> um but yeah uh <laughs> so where was i i don't remember what i was talking about today <laughs> okay so thinking about what we were reading in surviving the future about the like ideas of continuity and social belonging you know one of the things that i think is good about the parties in this game is that like they do mark the passage of the year really clearly and they do have that a little bit of that the same thing every time it's a little bit boring in a game because like the time scale is really short it doesn't take that long to get to the festival again Ooh, a new record and uh as far as like you know, gameplay loops, it's not that fun or interesting in and of itself. Um, after you've done like the, you know, pumpkin festival so many times, you're just kind of like, okay. Um, uh, oh, thank you, Aradin, for the gift sub. And uh, yeah, uh, thanks. I'm glad you thought it was really great, the conversation Aradin on Sunday. Um, it was very much like a kind of last minute thing and i had a lot of fun <laughs> kettlestick i think this is probably true but yeah i have a low vegetable cooking skill i think oh man okay different note i just cannot wait until this thing is done under construction i want to get cows okay i'm gonna sell some of these more fancy fishies um, yes, okay, let's see, do I need any of these for the community center? It does not look like it. All right, I'm just gonna put them in here. <laughs> if there's room, if there's room, I'm gonna put things in there. There is not room. I need more, oh, it's 1 a.m., okay, I'm going to bed. Uh, right more. I will not have a cow while well, I'm waiting to get a cow. It's 1 a.m. I don't really have time for stuff, so I'm going to go to sleep. Uh, let's see how much money I made. That's exciting. So, yeah, like feeling the passage of time, feeling connected to the cycles. Oh, level 7 fishing! <laughs> New crafting recipes. Fishing rod proficiency is up. I'm still using the training rod, but... <laughs> Oh, wait, am I? Am I still using the trainer? I might not be, but. Oh, man. Oh, man. I'm just so excited for all these animals. I should really get a second silo as well. All right, fortune teller. Somewhat annoyed today. Oh, my goodness. Weather report. Clear and sunny all day tomorrow. Okay, okay, that's fine. That's fine. <gasps> the barn is finished. Oh, I'm gonna go look inside. Oh, I'm gonna open the gate, even though I don't have any cows yet. Look at this, this is great. And I even already have a heater to put in here. That is so exciting. All right, I got so many things to do today in the game. <laughs> uh... So yeah, I mean, I think that one of the things that I like about this game as well is that like even just the crops that you can grow help you really feel the seasons and thinking about like what is in season food even mean, you know, in the modern grocery store, there, as you can see, my cat thinks that is, uh, and we do have music, my kitty, this is Babby, it's almost dinner time, and he's very much like, hey, hey, you gonna feed me yet? He's such a good kitty, though. Oh, yes. Okay. All right, you don't sit on my keyboard. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Kitty cat. He just wants so much loving right now. He's like, it's almost, it's almost meal time. It's almost meal time. Give me the food. Give me the food. Yes. Okay. Okay. What am I even doing right now? Harvesting things. My inventory is full. 
Yo, this is hard. This is hard. <laughs> so many conflicting things balancing out with each other. Okay, I'm gonna sell some stuff. I'm gonna sell some stuff. I don't have anything to do with these midnight carp right now. I'm gonna sell this fish for now. I just I just don't have room for things, so it's just going it's just going to be sold. Alright, put some produce up. Um I haven't even watered anything yet. Busy, busy, busy. Let's get these two in here. I'm having to like crane around because uh my cat is in the way. I can't see anything. Okay. Get that heater. Put this in here. I don't need this right now. I can sell these two things as well. I should get my scythe. I just forgot about that. Okay. Let me get that scythe. Sweet. Alright, so then thinking about like, yeah, feeling connected to the passages of the year, feeling the continuity of time. I mean, I think one of the other things that this game does is the idea that like this farm has been in your family for a long time. And you, yes, you are the wealthy landowner who is the top 1% of your town. And you know, like, if we want social mobility, you have to have downward mobility. Yes, a thousand percent. And, and, uh, on the flip side, just the idea that it's been in your family for so long. And, you know, you might not be doing the exact same things that your family did historically, but there's a power in that. And there's a pride that can come from that. This idea of, like, I am part of this larger sort of story. And uh, I also like that you all are talking about how to cook vegetables. <laughs> um, yeah. And there's, there's a lot of power in this. There's also the power of just the knowledge, like knowing the land here, right? Knowing how the earth, the ground is, how it responds to things. But I also just think that like, you know, having the festivals in the game, just marking the passing of seasons in that way, this game does a lot to build up the sense of place in the passage of time from like how every thing transforms and looks different depending on the seasons, like the trees and everything, what kind of floats through the air depending on the season, uh, just all of this stuff, really great. Like this is all a great example of building up that strong sense of place and that strong sense of like, this is, time passing, this is connecting, this is, all right, let's put the heater here. And, oh my goodness, I'm just so excited to go get some animals. I think, I pet the chickens. All right, let's go do it. Um, all right, I can get those things later. Those aren't very useful. Get some animals, let's do it. And you're right, Ice Bunny, that is a great way to do it. That is a great way to cook vegetables. All right, Marnie, please be here, because I just want to get some animals. I want to get some animals. Oh my goodness, where are you? Where's your mom, kid? Where's your mom? Where'd you go? Closed for the day. Oh my goodness. You all see this? You see this? The game is trolling me. Well then, the game is trolling me. I can't believe it. Ugh. Ugh. The game is trolling me. That's fine. That's fine. That's fine. I'll just take some supplies and go to Robbins and get something else made. That's fine. Now let's get another project going. Maybe another food silo. Cause I think that that's really, uh, 
control hype. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think another food silo is really important because I really want to have enough of everything for the winter. Especially if I'm going to get a bunch of cows. Oh yeah, look. The pale ale is done. That's exciting. So I can give Pam her alcohol. Um, let me put the water in the dog bowl. Come on, come on, come on. You are a cute puppy. Alright, we're going to get some stuff. We're gonna go. I don't know what I want to have built or how much of anything it's gonna take. So I'm just gonna bring a bunch of stuff with me and see what I'm gonna get built. We'll see. I really only do one thing at a time. Oh, where did we get enough? Style is 100 stone, 10 clay, and five copper bars. It's your brand. You are always on top of this. Like, I do not have enough copper for that. So, huh, I'll just have to get another one later. Um, I will take what I have. <laughs> I'm gonna just kind of show up with some random stuff. Yeah, but thank you. I really appreciate it, Mr. Brun, that you're always like, yeah, okay, here's, here's the information. Uh, Ice Bunny, you said, LOL, good to know I am not the only one doing lazy cooking. Ever tried fake meats? Yes. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with meat eating. I experienced fake meat are often spice, a nice spiced, uh, than the real thing. Yeah, I like fake meats a lot. And, uh, uh, Darth Beeble and I often cook frozen veggies, um, as our sort of baseline. We just like keep some of it's because also it's like tends to be a bit more environmentally friendly um because you don't have like the oh my gosh is robin also gone uh, aerobics club right okay fine so like tuesdays are just useless useless days i mean it's fine it's great it's great that they have this sense of belonging and they do it at the same time every tuesday and they have the ritual of it and it's connecting them with their bodies and grounding them. It's great. I am very happy for them. I'm very happy for them. All right, that's fine. That's fine. It's fine. No problem. Cave carrots. I don't think I've ever even encountered a cave carrot yet, so. That's a good point, Kettlestick. I know where everybody is so I can give them gifts. All right, let's see. What's going on? Yeah, like you're hanging out with me every Tuesday. You're right, oh, so it's funny. Let's see, is there anything I want to buy? Uh, nope. How much is this? 10 grand? No, not now. <laughs> I can afford it, but I need to save a lot of that money. All right. Let's see, where's Pam at? You in the bar already? No? How's it going, Gus? Let's see. Got any recipes for me? Um. This music is so good. I just feel chill. I'm just like, yeah. Hi, please relax and enjoy yourself. Uh, did your brand, you said, I was vegetarian for 11 years. I have tried so many fake meats and I was happy to eat them or eat meals without even fake meats, but the fake meats are highly processed, not necessarily the most nutritious option compared to the whole food ingredients. True. Um, Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Kettlestick, lol, there's somebody in the world who is mad that Arya isn't where she normally is Wednesday to Monday, and they're going, oh, Arya, it's streaming now, I can't buy any cows today. Or wouldn't it be cows, what would, it wouldn't be cows, what would I sell? What would I sell? Bad advice, that's what I would sell. <laughs> and strong opinions. 
That's 100% what I would sell. Bad advice and strong opinions. All right, Pam, are you at home? No, and apparently I'm good enough friends with Pam. Just walk into her house. Pam's not here. Where are you, girl? I have beer to give you. <laughs> Consent training? I mean, it's not too on the nose. Uh -huh. All right, and that's... <laughs> uh, I'm basically Lucy Van Pelt. <laughs> Um, and yeah, I can't buy strong opinion state. Let's see, community board. Two dozen eggs, any takers? I can do that. I'll do this one. I can get two dozen eggs. I have so many eggs already. Okay. All right. I gotta remember that Tuesdays are just kind of bluff in this game because everybody's out doing stuff. It's fine. I just wish they would invite me. I got an anchor. <laughs> Ancient pirates. All right, let's go bring that to the museum. Or right, did it just close? Did I literally just miss it? I think I did. Maybe. Yes. So yeah, thinking about better sense of collect rewards. Yeah, I missed it. I don't want any of these rewards right now. Okay, Elliot, I'm going to say hi to you. It's been said that a pirate ship full of plundered gold shipwrecked here a long time ago. Cool. Cool story. Nice. You know, Aradin, there is some of that. You know, oh, got crunchy. Why? What happened? Wow. Okay. Let's just turn down the music and see. Why? What even happened? I'm so confused. What is going on? The game is also like stuttering. Mm. Mm. The sound got crunchy. Uh, Pam should be at the saloon now. Let's see. Yeah, that's gross. That's gross. Give me a slurp. Oh, yeah, that's the stuff. It's real nice and hoppy. Notes of citrus and pine, but with a robust body to keep it grounded. Thanks, kid. This means a lot to me. I knew I could count on you. You're welcome. I'm going to turn the music off because it is gross sounding. <laughs> At least to me, it's like really bad. It's like... What? Oh, right. I was like, why is there a question mark here? Because that's where I'm going to put the eggs. Okay. Ugh. I don't know, Darth Beeble, if you're still watching, we really should get on top of ordering a new computer. <laughs> My old laptop is just not that up to the task these days. Yeah, let me check it out. I'm going to do a little look at my task manager. Let's see what's up. If anything is going on. No, it doesn't look like it. I mean, system interrupts is always doing weird things. But I've I've had problems with this computer since I got it. Um, with system interrupts just being like a constant thing where it's just a, like a taking over a lot of stuff and mm. 
Kettlestick. Oh, Elden Ring has a mod, and you're actually excited about it? That's cool. Yeah, I don't see anything going on in the background that's too... I mean... Well, maybe it is my anti-malware, because it's suddenly using a lot of my CPU. And a lot of the power. Oh. Ooh. Could be that. Could be that. I'll check out the, ske the schedule of things um, later. Good thinking, though. Um, yeah, I need a new computer. I want to be able to play better video games. I mean, not that this game isn't amazing. Uh, I just want to be able to play some games. And uh, do more things on my computer. <laughs> and do some video editing, because I want to make cool videos. And... Uh, we're going to try to make more like YouTube videos and all that jazz. We're going to try anyway. Try to make some cool stuff. Oh yeah, let me make a uh, couple of these. Oh, I can make a recycling machine like right here. Cool. Got an achievement for that. Oh man, I've got so many iron bars. It's actually quite useful. Um... I really would like another tapper, actually, so I can get more uh, good stuff. Um, I do not want to make another crab trap. It's not. Yay! I know. Finally, a recycling machine. <laughs> um, gosh, where should I put it? I'm like really need to upgrade my house so I have more room for things. I'm gonna put my recycling machine here. If I can. What? 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 Come on. Come on. This is such a good spot for it. I guess not. I guess it's not a good spot for it. Fine. Fine. What if. Can it fit here? It can. Okay. That's fine. Uh, no. That's actually a terrible spot for it because I won't be able to get to the other thing. What am I going to do? Where will this go? All right, I'm going to put it here. There we go. Uh, <laughs> all right. I need to not have so many sad sounds, first and foremost. Um, this guy is also going to be blue because I'm going to put more fish related things in here over time and then I don't know what I'm going to do with all these other chests I just I just made the chest because <laughs> I kind of need them um which tree do I want more from I think it's this orange tree that is going to give me the stuff that I can make more barrels so where's another orange tree like when it's closer to me so I don't have to walk so far away to check it but it doesn't look like that's an option hmm hmm all right I'm gonna put this tapper here why not all right two dozen put the spare chest inside the other chest yes Look at my little babies. Look at my little babies sleeping with their eggs. Amazing. Two dozen eggs. I can definitely do that. I think I can do that tomorrow. Let's see. Not even making any mayonnaise right now. Okay, can't quite do that tomorrow because I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, I need a couple of days. So many gold star eggs. Um, mm hmm. Mm hmm. Let me get my watering can ready for the morning. All right. Gonna do at least one more day, probably two more days, because I'm. This is very relaxing. 
<laughs> All right. So then let's think about some of the other stuff that the book was talking about. Oh my goodness. Level up in farming. Level nine. I can make iridium sprinklers now. Can't even get iridium, but I can make iridium sprinklers. And a seed maker, watering can proficiency, hoe proficiency. Amazing. That is amazing. This is great. This is great. Yes. Oh, Ice Bunny, you're going to the Botanical Garden tomorrow. I hope you have a great time. Queen of Sauce rerun, fortune teller. Okay. Very happy today. Weather report. Rain all day tomorrow. That's great. Amazing. <laughs> I want that. Okay. Nothing else. Super ready to harvest a little bit of corn. All right, so I just gotta water things. Let's just do this, watering, watering. One thing I'm really looking forward to is in the winter, upgrading my tools. Like that'll be very, very nice. Unlock the secret woods, break down bigger boulders. I know, Kettlestick, you never upgrade the watering can because you just like to make the better sprinklers. Um, but I might upgrade my watering can one more time. And uh, maybe not, though. Like, because I'm only going to do a small thing, and I should be able to make enough sprinklers for that. Because uh, I'm mostly going to focus on animals in this game. Animals and orchards. I also just want to buy so many fruit trees from Pierre. That's another thing. Uh, that'll be nice. All right, scythe time it is. Wait, no, I'm going to go pet my chickens because they're cute. Let's go pet the chickens. Yes. Okay, Kettlestick, you say you like having an upgraded watering can, but it's so low, low on your priority list it never gets done. And then Ice Bunny, my plan is to go out and do things that are fun now that the Rona is relatively low over the summer. Yeah, it's going to return sooner than we want, for sure. I mean, it's difficult times in the world right now. And uh, hopefully, though, things start to get better soon. That would be nice. All right, that would be very nice. Um, yeah, it's not it's not so low these days in the areas I'm in either. Um, it's very unfortunate. Oh yeah, look at that! I can make another barrel to make more alcohol. <laughs> um, do I have all the things I need? No, I need a copper bar. Oh, I need a copper bar. Welp. I would go to the, uh, the mines, but seeing as I need to go and get some animals, there's too much stuff going on today. It's a busy day. And I want to get, I want to get another silo going. All right, sweet. I'm going to just go get some animals now. Oh my goodness. I got a crab. I'm gonna get that in the crab pot when I come back, and that is great. I'm pretty sure I need that for the community center. The community center makes me very excited. See, this is another thing. It's like, just the contributing. You know, we've talked a lot about how we can sort of build communities that make us feel more belonging and serve us better and all of these good things. And there's just like, I don't know. I just want people to feel less lonely. I can buy a cow. I'm so excited. Can I get two in one day? Okay, okay. Mm. Let's see, who wants to be named after? Who wants me to name my first cow after them? We got Silly Millie and we've got Krellin for, for the, uh, chickens 
A Rodney will be a cow? Okay. Do you want it to be called a Rodney? Oh, did you on you two? Okay, so I'll get to one for each of you if I can get two today. Uh, a Rodden, what do you want it to be called? Sure, yeah, okay, sweet. Okay. All right, can I get another cow? I can't, yes! <laughs> that was a gross sound. Uh, did you run, what do you want it to be? Oh, Ice Bunny, yeah, when I can get bunnies, I'll definitely name one after you. Uh, the what do you want it? Tenador, okay. Fork in Spanish. <laughs> nice, nice. All right, so now I gotta get a supply. I gotta get a milk pail. Let's see, anything else? Those are all the supplies you sell. Okay. Milk pail. This is great though. I have two cows now. Amazing. Yeah, man, my game is like choppy and stuff. Silly. Very silly. Oh, I know what I can do with this other... Um, Ugh, I'm sorry, all those sounds are sad. Yeah, two cows. I'm very excited. The cows are great. Cows are so cute in real life. I love cows. Um, it's great. It's great. Great, let me tell you. Okay, okay. Let's do this. Look at my chickens. They're so cute. Just sitting here. Month old, yeah, my cows. Look at this, this is amazing. Um, what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here's Babby again. He's purring really loud because it's almost dinner time. I did not get more chickens yet. Um, oh, yeah, I was gonna put, um, Goat's milk, yogurt, and cheese. Yeah, I like goat's milk and yogurt and cheese. It's just great. No, I just want... Yeah, okay, I'm going to put this in the place with the cows. Um, it's going to be a little tough because I don't have an auto feeder or an auto pet. Oh my goodness, I just left. Just left the room. But I can put... My milk pail in here, but actually wait. Um, Nugget is a chicken name. Oh no, permitted term Nugget. Oh no, what's the oh no's? Just because the term was term is milk. Can I get? Can I? Can I milk you? Oh, too young to produce milk. <laughs> okay, too young to produce milk. I don't know when they will be old enough, but... Um, yeah, I don't know why Nugget would have been, like, auto-blocked. It doesn't make sense to me either. Oh, it's going to rain tomorrow, so, like, I might as well put some stuff out. That makes... that sounds like a good plan. Yeah, I don't know what could be possibly wrong with that word. All right, I'm going to just put enough out just in case two days in a row is rainy. So now I have that. Okay, let's go to Robin's and let's get some more things. Wait, I should probably chop down this tree behind here, yeah. Yeah, if I'm gonna put another um, silo in, I'm probably gonna put it in right behind that one. So I should probably top, chop down that tree, get it out of the way. I'm gonna sell these things. Sell this and this. Sweet. Um, 
Yeah, I don't know. Automog can be really strange sometimes. Chop down these little things. All right, all right. Let's go. Hmm. Let's go, let's go. Hopefully Robin is still open and I can Yay, Robin! Okay, how much is it to upgrade my house? 10,000 gold, four, yes. Should I do this or should I build another farm building? What do you all think? Upgrade my house or farm building? Hmm. How do I make the, a boat? How do I do that? Can I do that with boat? Oh, yes. Um, index, how do I do, I don't understand. Silo, I mean, I, my current silo is pretty much full. Oh, well, I accidentally clicked yes, just clicking back on it. So there we go. There we go. I'm getting a new house upgrade. That's <laughs> wonderful. Wonderful. Okay. Well, uh, yeah, I know. Very much whelp. Um, oh, okay. So I think that I should also get a workbench for crafting things at some point. I don't need it right now. I don't need any of these things right now. It's not really useful. Oh yeah, I just want to for for kids. I know I really should be better, but thankfully, thankfully their food is full basically. Um yeah, the workbench one of my favorite things you can buy. Um a really good price or a good point or and why is the the work or the budget TV. Um, yeah, not feel like working today. I understand that. Do I have the crab with me? I do. Let's go put it in. Let's go put it in the community center. <laughs> That's exciting. <laughs> crab pot bundle. Oh my goodness, I'm going to complete this. Bundle completes. That's amazing. Oh, I got three more crab pots. That's fine. <laughs> uh, that's fine. Sure, 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 sure. Um, let's see. River fish. I should do some more river fishing because yeah. Let's see the Junimos. Let's see the Junimos do the thing. Woo! They're so cute. Where are you going with a little package? What are you gonna do with it? Put it in your hut. Nice. Well, house upgrade. <laughs> I can't believe I just like accidentally clicked on that. I mean, like I can believe it. I absolutely believe it. That it's very much like me, uh, but it's funny. All right, Caroline. Hi there. Do you have everything you need for the farm? I do. If not, we might be able to help you out. Thank you so much. We carry over. Oh my goodness. You're just advertising your store. I'm trying to say hi. I'm trying to say hi. I want to be your friend. Not advertise your store to me. I, can, <laughs> I was so excited to complete that and just three more crab pots. I mean, that's fine. 
I only am doing the crab pots to finish the crab pot thing, but that's fine. It's fine. I will put them down in my house. I mean, not in my house. All right, here we go. Crab pots. Crab pot time. Crab pot time. Got to bait them. All right. Well, crab pots it is. Sweet. I like it. One of the things that's funny to me is how, like, there's more sticks and stones. Like, the sticks appearing makes a lot of sense, but the stones just appearing doesn't really make any sense. I mean, it's fine. It doesn't have to make sense. It's just silly. Silly, silly, silly. All right, I'm going to clean up some of this area a little bit. Yes. Okay. Surviving the future, thinking about carnival and parties. Right? So I think that the way the carnivals are currently set up in this game, they're fine. And but I would say that the like the spring dance is probably the best one in terms of like this is actually got a very ritual element to it and it's really about connecting the people and it's not so much for the sake of tourists because I would really say that a lot of the festivals that this game does are very focused on tourists. Like tourists come and it, to me, it does not seem like it really is connecting the people together so much as catering to the expectations of tourists. And, you know, it's not to say that like, doing that is inherently bad. You know, bringing tourism in can be really good for a community and really be impactful in a positive way. And I totally didn't put the sap in there and I should have some things to recycle. Let's start the recycling game. <laughs> uh, get some, what? Oh man, I didn't realize I could leave just by going over this high up. I thought it was really just along the path. Anyway, that was surprising. You know, it's, it's, that event, I think, is the one that's the sort of the most beneficial directly to the people of the town in terms of uh, offering people something, connecting them with each other. Um, Halloween, no tourists come for that. It's true. It's true. And there is like a maze and people do those things. But it's still kind of, I would say, like, it's not as much about connecting with each other. Given that the season's almost over, I'm going to chop down some of this grass to get some more hay. Hopefully. Hopefully get some more hay. Um, yeah, and the dances are a good place for people to get rejected. <coughs> That's an amazing point. It's very true. Um, yes, and it's also like you have this sort of like... Uh, flower queen and you can have this like conferring of like a special place within the community for different people in the year there's all this really good stuff to it um let's see what other holidays are there i mean like generally speaking even if you're not christian or even just culturally christian right like even if you weren't raised in a christian family like a lot of us have like might not be religiously Christian, but are at the very least culturally Christian. Like, even though I'm a pretty devout Buddhist, I still know that I have a lot of cultural Christian influences on me. Um, all right, I'm not getting any hay from this, so I'm just going to give it a rest. Uh, I think that Christmas, just like sort of ritualized gift giving can be really nice. Not in the sort of hyper-consumptive, hyper-capitalist way things are set up now. I don't really love that, of course, but uh, the exchanging of things and the acknowledging of each other that tends to 
can come along with that, not tends to, but can, I think can be really powerful in a community. And uh, I think that's also really important. And sharing of resources in general is really important and can build very strong connections with each other. And um, I think it's really nice in general. Uh, what else was I gonna say? Hmm, 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 hmm. Krellen, you said the spring dance is terrible from the game design standpoint because it's basically impossible to not get rejected and alienated the first one you attend, but that makes it even better at making it a ceremony of the locals because the first year you aren't one. Yeah, I mean, I think this is a very good point, Krellen. Um, and it also is nice because it shows that as the year went on, things changed. I mean, I'm doing a very terrible job of wooing my future husband at this present moment. I should actually give him some things, but uh, I'll get to that. Maybe maybe I'll just carry a frozen tear around for a while. So that way, when I do run into him, I can... It's going to rain tomorrow. That's really nice. Uh, I'm going to fill up my watering can real quick and put this in there. I don't need it for tomorrow because it's going to rain. Uh, I can make more refined quartz. This is very nice. This recycling machine probably needs to be moved, though, because it's a little too close to just like the, the edge of the world, so <laughs> or the edge of the region. Uh, what else? What else? I can put this away because I need a copper bar for that, which I can't currently do. Um. If I go to the mines tomorrow, copper pickaxe and cutlass, useful. I don't know if you can hear my cat. He just ate, so I don't know why he's screaming. Probably he wants playtime. Let me say hi to the puppy. All right, all right. Mm. I'm gonna do... Charlie's home needs cooking. I'm not gonna eat soon, but I wanna do one more day because it's very, very nice. So that should be good. One more day and then I'm gonna sign off, but this has been relaxing. So just thinking about how we could make things better. I don't know. I just want to build a better world with all of you <laughs> and like have people feel like they can do things. Uh, and uh, you're right. Both of our <laughs> kettles like one more day in a run and when our cat's not hungry, it's just absolutely true. How many days does it take? Eight. So I don't have time to make more sunflowers. That's fine. Um, I'll save the seeds. Where am I going to put them? Oh, I'm just going to put them here for now. Uh, I'll save the seeds for later. Over here. Nope, not this one. Oh, sound effects. They're getting gross again. I don't understand. I don't understand. Why are these getting so gross? All right, I gotta go pet my my animals. I gotta go pet the animals. Cow. Cow. Tenador, you're still a baby. Rod, you're also still a baby. I'll have to check up on you later. All right. All right. Yes, my chickens, you're so good. <laughs> okay, let's do some mining. That sounds really fun. I haven't gone to the mines yet today. So let's just think about it. Like thinking about what we were reading about the power of carnival, right? Like remember carnival is not, necessarily talking about like 
shitty parties where you stand awkwardly in the corner. It's not talking about things that are like meant for tourists, often to the detriment of uh, the people in the local area, like the Olympics often is not great for the people in the local area. All right, I'm at 85. Let's see how much further down we can go. I'm excited for this. All right, I know the spirits are neutral today, so this is not likely to be super great. But just thinking about like, how do you think these things would affect you? Like if you really had this kind of like hardcore social belonging and place and like there was this passing of the year that you could really feel and how things were organized and like you were also connected to the land. And even if you weren't a farmer or didn't do anything really with the land, you could still feel like, oh, here's the th things the other people in my community are doing that support me and like keep me alive. And here are the like ways in which uh, I fit into this. And here, like we're celebrating each other's achievements and look at the things that we offer to each other. And here's my place within it. And gave you, even if you weren't popular, even if you didn't have a ton of friends or whatever, still gave you a sense of like shared identity and belonging with people. How would that kind of make you feel? And especially if parties were like just awesome and a chance to like really connect with other people in these deep ways. I mean, this is one of those things where like Brave New World, if you haven't read it, I really recommend it. And if you haven't read it in a while, I think it's really still a great book to go back and reread because it makes a lot of really good points and it has a lot of really good insight into uh, some bigger things that I don't think the guy was necessarily trying to say, especially because he was also a eugenicist and like thought that the moral thing to do is make it so that disabled people don't exist anymore, which you know is not the grace. Oh yeah, look at that, got that. Okay, okay, bat, I'm gonna fight you. Get your butt over here, I'm gonna fight you. Get over here. And you're right, Krellen, I'm pretty sure everyone has been a net loss. I just, but I am curious about what you said. Let me pause this. I and my brother plan a barbecue for our family and prepare a white elephant in a game you would play on a kid's birthday. And I get a cake and put candles representing the number of all our ages. And I hope we can make it a fun transition because I don't travel in winter. And I just, but I want to support been good for anything. I think that party sounds amazing. Like, I think that in family stuff, or even just in friend group stuff. Like just, you know, because some of the stuff for all oh, those creepy dudes, they freak me out. I don't want to fight them. So I'm going to go this way and hope I can find some stairs over here. Creepy, creepy. Um, you know, it's, it's, we're talking about these like big ideal situations. And again, it's really easy to feel like this is impossible and get overwhelmed by it. And like, we can't make differences. And, you know, but having a sense of like shared identity and community and realizing our interdependence with each other at any scale increases one solidarity and helps us make sure that we understand. It's like with this stuff of like casual racism and microaggressions of these sex positive parties. I'm going to write an article and do a YouTube video with my co-director about how cultural appropriation and rape culture are part of the same spectrum, which is basically this idea of like, I am so entitled to the things I enjoy and want to do that I'm allowed to take whatever I want, even at the detriment of people who are saying that it's harming them. Oh my goodness, this guy's just attacking me, attacking me, attacking me. I'm almost out of energy, but luckily my health is okay. This is harder, y'all. <laughs> These deeper levels are scary. <laughs> So many things fighting me at once. And so like, you know, if I can get these people who are sort of very feminist organizers, oh no, oh no, oh no, oh no. Oh my goodness, don't die. No, I died in the mines. Okay. Okay. Ariel? Ariel, wake up. Thank you so much for saving me, Linus. I found you unconscious in the mines. You're lucky I haven't passed by. A little more careful next time, okay? Ugh, it was bound to happen at some point. 
400 gold and two items for my backpack. Thankfully, they're not very valuable. And it's only 400 gold. Uh, let's just eat. Let's just eat a bunch of, of blackberries and then maybe go back into the mines. Um, you know, uh, if I can get these very feminist organizers to see the ways in which cultural appropriation and sort of like disrespect and diminishment like is, is connected to these other things. And we can see that like the baseline autonomy that un is underneath both of them. And we have a shared sense of like your well-being and the outcomes of your life are directly connected to my well-being and the outcomes of my life, even just from a very, you know, like cost-benefit analysis, selfish sort of point of view, I can see the ways in which I benefit from helping these other people, et cetera, et cetera. That can be really powerful and a really powerful tool for creating more autonomy and more solidarity. And a place that really brings us together and is like stress reducing and has this shared element creates strong social bonds and can be incredibly powerful. Okay, get away from me, little dude. I'm gonna fight you. Okay, I'm gonna fight you. Don't hurt me. <laughs> oh. oh my goodness. And so like, you know, uh, these parties can be really useful for that as well because it can bring us together and give us the space that's very like transformative and a ritual and you know i mean for me if there's like racist things happening those events are like defeats the purpose for me and takes me out of it and like you know like i i there are a lot of types of events that i just don't go to because i the risk is too high and i don't want to get into a fight with somebody um and uh but going back to the main idea like we can do a lot of these things on a smaller scale like if we have good family relationships creating like every year we do a family reunion i think that's why christmas is so powerful for so many people even if they don't love gift giving or they're not christian just the like ritual of we always get together we're always dressed in certain ways we like have a order to which we open presents and you know, like we always listen to Elvis Christmas music and that's what my family does. And like, that's, that's a thing that's like powerful and transformative and like really creates a sense of connection with me and my family and feels good. And is also stress reducing because we know how things are going to play out and it's going to be nice or with your friends. You know, having like a friend's Christmas kind of thing or a friend's event where you always get together, you always do the same things. And then one of the other things that's important is that like, you know, people make this comment of related to things like divorce and it's a little bit disingenuous, but it's not entirely wrong either, which is that when we have a place where it's so easy for us to just not feel that we owe each other anything or like have these deep connections when there's conflict it's really easy for us to just feel like okay i'm just gonna walk away now i think it's pretty rare that people just get divorced willy-nilly for no reason and sure some people do for some people whatever I, but i think the vast majority of people who get divorced it's like definitely the right decision and i'm glad it's an option available to them but the 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 underlying point here is that when we live in a world where we're not geographically tied so much or it's very easy for us just to pick up and move or even expected for us to pick up and move where we tend to live far away from the friends we've had for decades and family and everything we it makes it harder to create i'm sorry my cat is like banging on his litter box he loves to come and scratch it um so if you hear a bunch of noise it's because my cat is marking his territory um <laughs> anyway like it, it definitely creates uh a, a, a sort of lack of solidarity there because we don't have the sense of interdependence and the lot like long connection and long time with each other and i know there's a bunch of good stuff in the chat and i'm very excited to read it oh my goodness okay i'm gonna go stand over by the ladder just in case i start to get overwhelmed by the invasion of the many bats that are coming 
<laughs> my cat is just so determined to be like, this is my spot to poo. This is mine. I claim this. Oh my goodness. Okay. Okay, hopefully is this the last one. That would be so nice. Yay, it is the last one. Okay, so then like, you know, it, it de-incentivizes us to work through conflict. And I don't mean like harmful, like abusive friends or people who are really unhealthy for us. I mean like conflict, conflict that is well within the sort of normative, healthy, like this is inevitability of human drama, but it's completely, you know, you can get through it, you can survive it. You know, we have, we're not incentivized to do that. And in some ways it's good, right? Like we have the ability to move if things really are, you know, we're in a space that's not good for us. But because we don't have this sense of like, we are interconnected in a sort of long-term, really meaningful way, it makes it harder for us to really, you know, one, be there for each other when things go wrong. To feel like, oh, what makes sense is for me to show up for my friends. Oh my goodness, I'm gonna, I'm gonna move over here and maybe this is okay. I'm gonna keep a real good eye on my health because <laughs> I don't wanna die. <laughs> we'll see how this goes. Oh my goodness, oh my goodness. Okay, well, that was surprisingly better than I was expecting. I hope I level up in combat. My goodness. Okay, I made it to 90. I got the obsidian edge, which is really great. Wonderful. I think that's better. 30 to 45 damage. Yeah, that is better. Not as fast. Um, not as fast, but I'm good. I'm gonna, I'm gonna quit while I'm ahead. <laughs> And the mine carts are right. I keep forgetting. I keep forgetting. I restored the mine cart so I can move easily. Okay. Well, I didn't get any copper ore, which I'm still trying to make it to the bottom. But the copper ore probably would have been a good idea because I need more copper. So that's okay. That's okay. Look at this though. Cave carrots. So many of them. And by so many, I mean like one or two. Uh, I just got so many things. And it's lovely. All right, all right. I don't know what the weather's gonna be the next game day. Let's see here. Gonna get this quartz, put something else in the recycling bin. I definitely am gonna read all your messages before we go um, because I think there's been a lot of good discussion in there. But yeah, the one of the bigger points is just if we have this sense of like connection and we're in it together for the long haul and we need each other, obviously, remember, there's always the qualification I'm making that I'm not describing a utopia. It, there's always going to be problems. There's always going to be people in whatever community in where we think that they're an asshole and we want to avoid them at all costs. And like, they just make us miserable and it's totally fine to want to avoid them and to not want to be in those spaces. There's nothing wrong with that. There's always gonna be people that we connect with less than we would like, and that it's not as great as it could be. And missed opportunities, right? Like we're not talking about perfect scenarios. I'm more just talking about like, if we have a sense of like, we are connected to each other, we are important to each other, this is a community, like, I need to work things out with these people and find common ground and, like, deal with conflict and our fates are tied and that's a powerful thing, right? Um, and we can do that in a really robust way with creating ritual with our friends. <laughs> and one of the ways that we can do that is through having good parties. <laughs> I know that this might seem just like a little contrived uh, to be talking about parties in the context of these bigger social issues, 
but it's important, right? Like this is one of the other things that a lot of activists and people who like come to activism from a place of deep feeling can really forget is that it shouldn't always feel shitty and like you're fighting the whole world and everything is terrible. It should also be a thing where there's joy and there's contentment and there's connection and there's, you know, power and there's like, we're doing these things and this is good and I have tons of trash in here. Um, and, you know, that's, that's also part of it, right? And even just now at the like level of like small community activism that you and I might do, it's important for us to sort of be in these spaces where we're connecting and things are going well and we're making shared identity and shared community. And I'm like rambling. Part of it's because I'm getting hungry and tired. Alrighty, let's see here. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna put the quartz up and then I'm gonna go to sleep and I'm gonna read your messages and then we're gonna be done for the day. But this is lots of fun. Okay, getting into bed. Go to sleep for the night, yes. All right. Um, Okay, Krillin, you mentioned that hosting the Olympics has always been a net loss for everyone. Did Chibron in the short term? Possibly, but I'd say that Barcelona benefited in the end because the city did a lot of infrastructure upgrades in preparation for the Olympics that the citizens still benefit from. And the tourism industry has grown because of it as well, which has its pros and cons. Ice Bunny, I'm a bit biased because I was the fat kid all my life and my uncle was a football trainer and at every family gathering when he was drunk, he claimed I said that I wanted to be part of a shitty sports club. Yeah. Detubron, I like to put a chest in this area to store snacks and tools and such. Um, in this area, I don't know where you're talking about, but probably it's a great idea. I was trying to think where would meant ice bunny and now i learned sports is a thing and adhd brain naturally dislikes and that the impulsivity promotes getting a role or two and you cannot imagine how many wanted to doctor me into being normal i disliked the traveling for christmas and i think changing traditions in the family was also a sign of not getting my elderly parents safe yeah um all right and your cats also like to just make tons of noise on their litter box I think the cat also just likes the like the mark making and like influencing its reality kind of thing of like I exist, I exist, I exist. I funny, I grew up in a four generation family. My great grandparents were around till I was sixteen and they lived next door and were at my parents for good and bad. Uh, and my oh mama had Alzheimer's and I babysat her or better played along with her, asking for her mom. I often get frustrated that some demand that I have always been so kind and understanding of people who have done me wrong. Yeah, I mean, these are all very good points that you're bringing up and show some of the like the good points and bad points of this context that we're talking about. You know, one of the things that could be possible is if we had communities that had this sense of interdependence and like we need to be there for each other and we need to be able to show up for each other, it could also help people have better communication skills and better emotional health um, to reduce some of these stresses. And then also just be able to support each other through difficult times and good times. Aradin, make sure to go and eat something, drink some water, and then play with the cats. Mine entrance, yeah, entrance of the mines. I think that's a good idea, Disturban. I will try to do that. All right, this is really lovely. I, we, we went for almost an extra hour. Um, I started late, so thank you all um, for joining me. Uh, Ice Bunny, your family also had a lot of war trauma. That is also an important thing. And I think with war trauma, communities don't have really good, and cultures don't really have really good current, like, healing rituals to reintegrate soldiers. I mean, it's one of the things... There's a really great book actually on PTSD in soldiers that is about 
uh, indigenous tribes versus sort of standard American reintegration of people after war trauma and how like ritual and reintegration after um, things like being a soldier and being in all these places. And one of the reasons why a lot of times trauma really hits people after they leave the military, because you have this like in a lot of these ideas of social belonging that we're talking about and like group identity and we're, we're have interdependence like with a person in their unit in the military is really possible and it's one of the few places where we really have that kind of structure for identity and belonging and mutual support in a lot of the world and it's very important because it's a great way to also sort of process and deal with and support people through trauma and we don't really extend that to a lot of other things. So this is a whole other topic and I would love to talk about this, but I wanna go eat. So it was lovely to hang out with you all. Thank you so much. Hopefully I will see you all this Sunday. I'm not 100% sure what the plan is for the Sunday, but I will let you know when I know. Hopefully I'll be talking about pride related stuff because it's gonna be June. And I hope you have a great week. Thank you so much for joining me. Bye.